Hello and welcome to another D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer, and this is the show where we sit here and I regale you with all the tabletop gaming stories and remember when something cool happened. So, uh, we've been doing one-shots lately, so let's try for another one. Everybody who's ever played D&D or Pathfinder or Harp, they always have to, you know, it's a social game. So you don't learn everything right away. You kind of have to find somebody that already knows how to play to show you the ropes. Because if you just, you and your buddies pick up a bunch of books and just start flipping pages, it's not going to go anywhere fast. Or you've got the one friend who learns everything right away and tries to teach everybody else. But everybody kind of has their, their episode zero, if you will, where uh, you're kind of led by the nose. You're kind of shown what D&D &D or, or Pathfinder or whatever is capable of in terms of like tabletop games with all the funny shaped dice and the, the character sheets and all that good stuff. And I thought I would share mine with you today. So this is probably the very first D&D uh, &D game that I ever did play. Uh, this was way back when uh, 3.5 was in full swing. I got a... Uh, it's not the red starter box because they just re-released that, but it was a D and D three point five starter box. It was very flat, very like book shaped. It was it was uh, very thin. It didn't have a lot of stuff in it. It was, um, it had like a small rule book and uh, three starting adventures in it, and it had tiddlywinks where you could you could uh, see the fighter's face on it, and that would represent them. Or, or the kobold, or the, the black dragon, or whatever it happened to be. And um, instead of like full on like painted figs, because those were expensive and that would have made the box like a $60 purchase and nobody would have played it. But I actually found it in like a Target somewhere in the toy section, just kind of like tucked in a corner, like they would sold all the rest and there was only one left. And I was like, hey, I've, been, I've always wanted to play d and I'm like 14 or 15 at the time. I've always wanted to play d and And, you know, there were no fancy bookstores or anything to, to buy tabletop gaming stuff from. Because if you want to go buy Pathfinder stuff nowadays, I have to go to like a Barnes & Nobles. Because, you know, those are $50 hardback books and stuff like that. But... I come from a town where it's small enough to see across and, you know, there are no buildings greater than two or three stories tall. So finding this at like a Target two towns over was a treat for me. I was like, oh, I've always wanted to play d and I should do this. And I grabbed it. And again, I have like books bigger than this, this dinky little starter box was. But, you know, I pulled it open and I pulled out all the bits and parts and looked at the maps and I was like, dang it, I need somebody to show me how to do this. And so, um, I don't remember if it was one of my friends, one of my neighbors, something like that, uh, who was who was a couple of years older than me, like almost 18, uh, said that, oh, you've, you've got the starter box. I know how to play d and I'll, I'll run you through one of the adventures. And I was like, oh, yeah, all right. So... And it came with pre-made character sheets, so we didn't have to worry about rolling characters. I just picked up the fighter, because he had the most armor and the most hit points and carried the biggest sword and stuff like that. Because back in the day, they would release all their boxes and modules and stuff with pre-made characters. So if you didn't want to sit for an hour and a half and explain to a new person how to do a character sheet, they could just pick up... Uh, what was it, the fighter, the rogue, the wizard, or the the druid, or whatever. It came with like five or six characters that you could just like pick up and, and find your corresponding tiddlywink and unroll the map, and there it is, get started. But you needed a DM, so I found somebody who knew how to play D&D. &D. It was a friend of mine, and we basically sat at the kitchen table to do this. It was just a, a duet game, one-on-one. -on -one. And duet games are, are obviously very different from, like, one DM and four people, but if you've got a brand new person who doesn't know what they're doing or, or doesn't, like, grasp what D&D &D is or how it works, duet games can be very, very educational because they have to separate their, like, video game knowledge. They have to separate their, um, their fear of all these weird colored 
you know, weird sided dice and things like that. And one or two sessions is usually enough to shed a lot of presumptions, a lot of fears, a lot of uh, can I do this or can I not do that uh, presumptions when it comes to tabletop games. So I'll quit talking in circles and we'll get into this. You, you know that I, I praise Pathfinder a lot because it's basically D&D 3.5 just better because I call it D&D 3.75 because they fixed everything. But the one area where D&D 3.5 beats the pants off of Pathfinder is their starter box. Because Pathfinder's uh, beginner's box sucks. And we'll get into that another day. But the D&D 3.5 uh, beginner's box, or starter box, or whatever, is perfect. Because it comes with all the characters, all the dice, it shows you how to DM, and it comes with not one, but three adventures to get you from level one to level three. And I was just going to play the first one because uh, it was small enough and easy enough that one person can do it if they're smart about it. And normally you'd think, oh, if you're running solo, you take the rogue, right? He's got all the skill points and the backstab and the sneakiness and stuff. No, I just went for the fighter, so... Here we have our singular hero. I think his name was like Kojam or something like that. The, the names for the old heroes were very strange. But we have our fighter, Kojam, with his big, you know, long sword and shield and, and plate mail and all that good stuff. More stuff than a level one person should probably have. But shut up, it's the starter box. And uh, the mayor of a village sees that he is a wandering adventurer and wishes to hire him uh, to take on some bandits. They go, what have these bandits taken? Have they killed somebody? And he goes, no, they have stolen a baby unicorn. And I go, a baby unicorn? How does that work? And he goes, yes, the, uh, this village does not encroach upon the forest to the north of here because it is the home of a fully-fledged unicorn herd. And I go, a unicorn herd? Like 20 of them? Unicorns are supposed to be really rare, right? And he goes, yes, these forests are wild and untouched, and, you know, the lord and lady of the forest is a stallion and a mare, and they are smart enough, they're magical creatures, they're smart enough to talk and warn people away and, and lay down rules, you know, don't cut down our trees, we'll zap you with our horn lasers, and... and Whatever that happens to be. Um, but there were so many rules around unicorns back in the day. If you wanted to, like, approach one or have one as a mount, you had to be, like, a woman, a virgin, uh, pure-hearted, pure-thoughted, and, and all, all kinds. That's not even a word, thoughted. But uh, you had to be pure in, like, seven different ways. To, to approach and touch a unicorn, much less ride on one or have one as like a mount. And I don't think I've ever seen someone with a unicorn as a mount, at least not that I remember. Uh, but the, the point of this was that uh, the lord and lady of the forest, the, this unicorn stallion and one of the mares, uh, had their baby stolen away by this group of bandits and it, it, he wanted to hire me for the price of 100 gold pieces to go and, and kill these bandits and retrieve the foal. And I go, 100 gold pieces? Great! Because, you know, at level 1, 100 gold pieces can get you pretty much whatever you want within reason. Um, and he goes, yes, you know, just make sure it gets back to its parents, you know, alive and well, and I'll give you 100 bucks. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. So... Kojam, you know, clanks deep into the woods along this set of cliffs. And uh, the sheer wall of the cliffs are interrupted by a door and a pair of dragon statues. And I go, I bet this is the place. So I, I kind of sheathe my sword on my back and, you know, put my shield on its hook. And I wander up to this thing and I'm like, wow, they really don't care who knows that we're that they're here. They're not very sneaky bandits if they've got statues outside the front of their damn <laughs> hideout. And of course, being the, uh, the newbie that I am, I wander right up to the door and try the doorknob just in time to set off a repeating fireball trap because the two dragon statues 
kids shoot fire on you. And I, I just like step up, ah, and I jump back. He's like, you took X amount of damage. And I go, why didn't I see that? And I go, you didn't look for it. You can do that? And he goes, yeah, you can do your, uh, your search check. And this is great. It, again, I, I think this adventure was so well made, but we'll get through it. And it, it teaches you right away to look for traps when there are uh, statues, look for details. Because actually, if you stop and do a search check, you can see scorch marks around the mouths of the dragon statues. So it's actually a very obvious trap, but being the newbie that's never played D&D &D before, I didn't know to look for it but it taught me a lesson. <laughs> so uh, after a while, I was like, okay, you said it's a repeating fireball trap, so that means it can go off more than once. And I was like, okay, how can I deal with this? I can't get up on the, on the stoop of this place without getting caught on fire. And I, I looked down at my character sheet. I was like, what have I got? I've got a tent and a crowbar and a couple of weapons and some torches. And I go, oh, I've got 20 feet of rope. Can I use the rope and just like pull the statues down? He's like, you can try, go for it. So I, I go up to the to the dragon statues and tie the rope around their necks. So I was like, okay, make a, you know, make a strength check and throw it. It's 19. Pull that dragon statue down. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go do the other one too. Pull that dragon statue down. All right, you can hear them clicking as you uh as you pull them down onto the ground, one of them, the head just like snaps off and you can see all these little oil bags come out onto the ground. That's why it was repeating because it had like a dozen of these little oil bags to serve as ammo. So every time it went off, it would pierce one of the bags, ignite it, and it would shoot out through the dragon's mouth like fire breath. And I go, oh, that's really clever. Uh, he goes, are you going to take any of those with you? And I go, no, I better not carry anything flammable. <laughs> so I leave those out where they are, having destroyed this thing. And I go, okay, now I'm going to step back onto the stoop, being a little more careful this time, and I'm going to try the doorknob again. And he goes, it's locked. And I go, damn it. And I was like, I don't have any like lock picks. And I'm, I'm checking my character sheet for like a key, because I'm still thinking like video game style. You know, surely there's a key laying around somewhere. No, it's just locked. And I was like, okay, can I, I don't have like a wood axe or anything. Can I break it down? Is that something you can do in D&D? Like I, I, the the Legend of Zelda mindset is like, no, you can't destroy doors. That's stupid. And he goes, yes, yes, you can. It's just wood. You can, you know, try the doorknob. It's locked. You know, if you can't, if nothing else, you can try and run into it or chop it down with a weapon or like shoulder check it off the hinges. It's supposed to swing outward, but if you rolled high enough, you could probably break it down, Kojam. And I go, okay, I'm gonna back up like 30 feet and charge at it. And he goes, okay, you're gonna roll this as an attack and add two because you got a running start. And I was like, oh cool, I get a bonus for running far enough? And he goes, yeah, that's how that works. So I'm learning very quickly uh, that you can get modifiers for, um, uh, positive circumstances and, and advantageous circumstances for trying to do even simple things like just shoulder checking the door doesn't do any good but if you run at it you get a bonus and I was like okay that makes sense so I'm learning all these little things as we go and I back up 30 feet and I run up the door and I roll like a three so it's boosh, and you just kind of bounce off Kojam and I go oh and I fall back onto my butt and I was like, you know, this wooden door has bested me. And he goes, yeah, you've probably alerted everyone inside that you're there also. And I go, oh, uh, I get up onto the stoop and I raise my fist like I'm knocking. You know, play it cool, play it cool. <laughs> and he goes, you get up onto the stoop and raise your fist just in time for uh, two guys to come to the door uh, looking angry. And they throw the door open. Who are you? What are you doing here? And I go, uh, uh, I punch him in the dick. <laughs> and he goes, what? And he goes, I squat down and just like double barrel shotgun, both, both fists, just like punch them both in the dick. And he goes, roll initiative. And I win the initiative somehow. And he goes, okay, roll for dual wielding fists. I'm not even sure that's actually a thing. Attacking two different people with two different fists. I guess that's technically dual wielding. 
which you would get like a minus four to your second fist if you allowed it. I'm not even sure how the mechanics of that work, but he allowed me to, and I said, okay, I'm going to roll, roll it 19. And even with the minus four, it's enough. So I punch both these guys in the dick. And then when they bend over to hold themselves, I just like bash them over the head. And he's like, okay, roll damage. Uh, you're, you're bare fisted, so just like add your strength. Six damage to both of them. So it's like, boom, ah, clonk, and knock them both out. And he goes, wow, that was amazing. And he's like, I didn't even have to pull my sword for that. I just knocked them both out. Yeah. It's like I roll them off the stoop. <laughs> so they go, they go tumbling off to one side and the other side. I was like, wow, that's two guys down. <laughs> How many bandits did the mayor say there were? And he goes, he didn't say. I was like, okay, I, I go inside. He's like, you go inside to this, uh, this kind of cave-like area. I mean, they, they mounted a door on the front uh, for security purposes, but uh, it, it's kind of cave-like in here. There's a torch or, or uh, a lantern burning on a table. You can see they were playing cards and, like, eating, eating provision, like, jerky. They've, there's a chest in the corner, and he describes all these little things, like there's a bedroll, and this is just kind of where they were hiding out while they were waiting to move the baby unicorn elsewhere. And I go, ooh, treasure chest! I run over there! And I go, the chest is locked. Damn it! Can I break that open? Well, no, that would probably make more damage. I go outside and I check both of them for a key. So, it, again, it teaches you to search the bodies, so I get all the gold they were carrying, I get a short sword, I get uh, a potion of cure minor wounds, and I get the key to the chest. And I go over and I open the chest, and sure enough, there's more gold pieces and like a, a small ruby inside, which is worth even more money. And he goes, yeah, you can sell that ruby for additional gold pieces and buy more stuff. And I go, wow, that's great, I love it. So, again, very dense, teaching me a lot of things. Traps, locked doors, combat, keys, you know, how, how all these different things work, and we're just in the first room, so this is very well constructed, very well made. And I was like, you know, can I take their food? Yeah, I, I guess. You know, they were, they were chewing on it earlier. Oh, I just rip off whatever they, whatever they ate off of, and I'll keep the rest. It's like, okay, you get like three-fourths of a ration. Good job. <laughs> and, um, I go on to the next room, and he's like, well, you're coming up behind somebody. There's a very small hallway, and you can see somebody squatted down in front of the door uh, working with, like, thieves' tools. He's trying to pick the lock. And I go, oh, somebody beat me to the punch. You know, I was like, I wonder how he got past those first two guys. Oh, maybe he, he can turn invisible, or maybe he just snuck by them. Like, that's the rogue that I didn't pick. Uh, when I was on the choose your character screen <laughs> and I was like mm, well I cannot pick locks so I'm just gonna not say anything and uh, just kind of stand in the doorway until he unlocks the door for me and then I'll challenge him and so Kojam kind of stands there with his arms folded like trying not to cast a shadow on him trying not to breathe too loud that kind of thing, and when he hears the, the door lock click, and he starts putting away his thieves' tools, he's like, Ah, oh, what are you doing? Ah, oh, what are you doing? And they face off immediately. This guy's got like a scimitar and a short sword, and I'm like, Oh, crap, he's, he's dual wielding. <laughs> so I like pull my long sword, pull my shield, and, and he goes, What are you doing here? I was like, I'm here to save the baby unicorn. And he goes, I'm here to take the baby unicorn for myself. These assholes don't know what they're doing. I'll I'll get the biggest profit ever. And all the while I'm thinking, why did they want this baby unicorn again? And the DM looks across at me and goes, well, the bandits wanted to keep the baby unicorn for breeding purposes to uh, start uh, like a small, not really stable, but like a small farm. They basically were going to try and have it bred so that they could harvest unicorn horns which are extremely hard to come by, very valuable uh, magical components, but it's also, you know, ten different kinds of evil cutting them off a live unicorn. So they were going to try and make more unicorn babies to get more horns. And I go, oh my god, 
Okay, um, I'm gonna face off against this dual wielding lockpick guy and save the baby unicorn myself. And so we fight, and you know, I've got the big shield and the thick armor, so who the hell is he kidding at level one, you know, one on one versus a fighter? You're not gonna win. So Kojam cuts this guy down, and I get his thieves' tools, and I get his his scimitar and his dagger, and he, he's got like a, a nice skull cap, and I keep that for myself. And it, sh it, again, shows you that you can loot the bodies. And I go, can I actually use these thieves' tools? Is that a thing that a fighter can do? And he goes, well, you can use them up until a lock is like a challenge rating of, or a difficulty rating of like 20. Because once it goes above 20, then only a rogue can do it. And I go, oh, so up to a certain complexity of lock, I can try for it. And he goes, yeah, basically. And I go, okay, well, it's good to have these anyway. Uh, if, if I can't find a key or just, like, kick the door in, then uh, I can certainly try to unlock it first. And he goes, yeah, pretty much. And so I kind of, like, roll this guy's body out of the way, and I, I, he's unlocked the door for me. And by now, I have learned it is not a good idea to come dashing into the next room. So I try the doorknob and I pull it and I peek inside and I find the baby unicorn. And I was like, there he is, yeah. And the floor is covered with hay and there's bags of feed to one side and there's brushes and like horse horse uh, care tools. It's like they were taking good care of him. They just, you know, had no right to actually have him. So and I was like, is there anybody else in here? And he goes, no, it looks like you got everybody. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any secret passages or, or hatches or anything. No, nope. looks like this is the end of this little, this little dungeon, if you will. It was just like two or three rooms. And I go, okay, yeah. And I go, well, how does one transport a baby unicorn, much less when it's probably been like captive here for some time? Like there's poop on the floor and they've been trying to scoop it up and stuff, and there's, you know, it, it doesn't look especially happy. It's kind of drooping and, like, uh, sleeping on its feet. And we go, do horses sleep on their feet? He goes, I think they do. And I go, no, they don't. And then we have this 10-minute argument about horses. Do they sleep on their feet or not? And it's like, it's a unicorn. He sleeps on his feet. <laughs> but um, I go, well... You know, I can, I can uh, check around the room to get a key for his bonds. You know, he's, he's got like this big, this big manticle basically around his middle so he doesn't run off. And it's like attached to a rope that's attached to the floor. It's like, well, he's going to wake up and freak out because I'm a new person and I smell different and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to like gently like on his shoulder, like shake him so he wakes up just a little bit. And, of course, the baby unicorn turns and, like, tosses his head. Like, I almost get an eyeful of freaking unicorn horn straight in my eyeball. And I was like, okay, okay, we're going to take you out of here. He's like, does he understand me? He's like, no, he's too young to be, uh, to be speaking just yet, even though he is a magical creature. And he's very intelligent. He hasn't grasped, like, like thought speak yet as a, as a unicorn. I go, okay. I'll, uh, I'll search the room for the key to his, his bonds. And, of course, it's just, like, up on a peg somewhere. And I, I undo the giant manticle that's around his middle, and I, I get the ropes off of him, and I toss it all on the ground. And it just kind of stands there, like, looking frightened and not knowing what to do. It's a baby. It doesn't know what to do. It's like, well, he's probably too big to just grab and put in my inventory. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's not exactly a sheep you can put over your shoulders. And I go, okay, um, I'm going to grab, like, a feed bag and see if I can't get him to follow me. And it's like, okay, I, I, I get, he goes, you get the, uh, the big bag of feed they were using, and you kind of, like, shake it at him a little bit, and he starts towards you. And I go, yes, perfect. So I was like, okay, I'm going to basically, like, give him, like, a little trail, just, like, trail it on the ground, like, breadcrumbs, and maybe he'll follow me out. And, of course... He does, like, toss his head and get a little upset when he smells all the blood because I've killed, like, three or four people since I got in here, and I am probably smell like smoke myself because I've been burned by a repeating fireball trap. But I manage to get him out, and I lead him towards the forest, and no sooner do we cross, like, the threshold into the foliage, 
then we run across uh, the uh, unicorn mare and stallion, the lord and lady of the forest. And I go, oh, uh, here's your baby, you know? And it's like, I don't even know what to say. It's like, it's like a king and queen of nature. And, you know, they don't like humans being near them. They're mad because their baby got stolen. They somehow communicated this to the mayor who told me and hired me. I was like, here's your baby. Don't skewer me with your giant magic horns. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm intimidated because there's like eight of these things here. There's the stallion, the mayor, and like a small group off to one side. If they decide they don't like me, plate mail's not going to help. It's like, I don't want them to shoot me with their horn lasers or whatever they've got to actually defend themselves. So I, like, like shuffle the baby forward. I leave the bag of feet on the ground and, like, slowly back away to, uh, to let that reunion take place. And, of course, the foal runs off to, to nuzzle with Mommy, and the stallion stands profile so that I can't see what's going on past them. And he, he does. He leans with, like, a toss of his head and some glittery unicorn magic, and he shoots a nearby tree and an acorn falls from the tree and turns into solid gold. And I, I go, solid gold, really? And he goes, yes, that is the, uh, the stallion's reward for you from the forest. And as you're watching, they turn and they return from whence they came out of sight. And I go, I go and I get the acorn. And he goes, yes, that acorn is uh, solid gold and is worth 60 gold pieces. And I go, wow. That and all the money I got off the guys and all the money I got out of the chest and the ruby and the hundred bucks I'm going to get for this quest, I'm going to be rich. You know, I, I think this totaled out to like maybe 300 gold, but being brand new at the time, it felt like I was freaking rich. And I go, well, I pocket the acorn and all my, uh, all my treasure, I guess. And I set back towards town. And of course, the mayor gives me my promised hundred gold pieces. And the, uh, the balance between the, uh, the town and the nearby magical forest is restored. The, the prince of the forest has been returned, and those that took him have been brought to justice by the level one fighter, Kojam. So that was the, uh, that was the, the starting adventure that came with the uh, D&D 3.5 like, beginner's box, or whatever you want to call that. And it had two more adventures in it, but that was meant for, like, full parties of, of four people. But the first adventure could be done with just one person, and that was kind of my experience with it. So I think it was really well done. It had, you know, a trap, a locked door, a couple of bad guys, um, you know, a guy you could talk to or fight. And, you know, I ended up fighting him, you know, a, a hostage situation ample rewards, a treasure chest that, that was locked or could be, you could find the key to it. It had a little bit of everything without getting too complicated, without involving too many NPCs. It was very, like, compact. It was only like a three-room dungeon, I think. And it made for a great one-shot to show me what D&D 3.5 was like. So, uh, I, that was probably... I think it was. That was like the first game I ever did play for D&D, and that was what got me into the hobby, uh, was seeing what the game was like with this adventure. So that was kind of like my episode zero, uh, as far as being like a new like greenhorn player that didn't know what he was doing. And my DM was really good and helped me along and showed me how everything worked, and I was hooked instantly. You know, here I am... <sighs> God, what, 15, 16 years later, still doing it. So call that my origin story, if you will. But I had a lot of fun with it. So uh, I guess that's all that we'll talk about for today. Uh, I'll talk about the, the Pathfinder Beginner's Box adventure another time because it wasn't nearly as good as this one, but it does make for another interesting story. So hopefully I will see you guys on the next D&D Stories. Keep gaming. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that like button for me. If you want to keep up with channel updates, check me out on Facebook. And if you're feeling especially generous, be sure to visit my Patreon. Keep gaming!